Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Zephron Olive, and I'm joined today by Richard. How's it going today, Richard? Hey Seth, what's going on? Uh, not much, I'm excited to talk some more Hour of Devastation. So, over the last few days we've talked pre-release cards, we've talked Commander, we've talked Standard, and now it's time to talk about the best Hour of Devastation cards for Modern. So, before we jump into the cards, Richard, any general thoughts on Hour of Devastation Modern? Good set, bad set, kind of in the middle, what's your thoughts there? Uh, slim pickings this time around. We, we, <laughs> had to, we had to dig a little deep, but there are some cards that look interesting, and you never know when they print a new card that breaks an existing card, so we have to keep a lookout for that. But uh, we have some cards pulled up here, so we can go through them, but uh, not not the most powerful cards for modern uh, at first glance. Yeah, I think there's stuff that has potential, but we don't have many, or maybe even any, just like obvious, oh, that's going to be so good in modern cards. Like we have in some sets, you see, I don't know, like Grim Flayer, or like certain cards that kind of stick out and you're like, oh, that's really pushed. I don't know if we have a card like that because the, all the mythics in the set are pretty expensive and the face card is a seven mana planeswalker. But anyway, let's jump into it. We got a lot to cover, so don't want to be too long winded with the intro. First up, we have a bunch of honorable mentions, which are cards that didn't quite make the top 10, but we wanted to mention briefly. So Richard, uh, uh, first up, we got a few cards here. A Braid, Scavenger Grounds, Dunes of the Dead, and Leave to Chance. Any thoughts at all on these honorable mentions? Uh, a Braid seems a bit weak. It's I don't know if Lightning Strike has been playable <laughs> in Modern, but if there are scary artifacts going around, uh, this might be a cheaper Coligan's Command, uh, but it's, it, it's pretty hard to justify two mana deal three damage. Scavenger Grounds is an interesting card. Aldrazi can play it as Graveyard Hate. Uh, you can sacrifice itself to exile all cards. Uh, so if you're willing to go down on other utility lands, Scavenger Grounds gives you a way to instantly hate Graveyard cards. So you can take out decks like Living End and stuff like that. Uh, Dunes of the Dead is an interesting card with Pox. You know, you have Orborgs to make your Dunes of the Dead produce black mana. Uh, you can sacrifice your lands. Uh, boom bust as well. Uh, you get a random 2-2 zombie. I'm not sure if that 2-2 zombie is worth all that <laughs> effort, but uh, there's some value there. And we have leave to chance. Uh, anytime you can return any number of permanents to your hand, you have shenanigans. So uh, Cheerios, Pure Steel Paladin decks, uh, basically decks with a lot of zero costed cards can somehow break leave. Yeah, I don't know if I have much to add to that. I do like Leave to Chance with Pure Steel Paladin. Uh, Scavenger Grounds, I worry because it's competing with Bajuka Bog, and you're right, it seems really good in Eldrazi decks or Tron decks where they naturally want colorless mana, but at first I was thinking like, oh, you can tutor it up with Knight of the Reliquary, but I think if you're doing that, you're probably better off just playing Bajuka Bog, because black is basically a colorless land if you're playing Naya or Bat or something, so there's not really much difference, and you don't have to pay mana. And a Braid might be a long shot, but I don't know. There's so many options for killing artifacts that I'm not sure this is better than anything else, but we'll see. Uh, well, let's... Smash the Smithereens gives you both for two mana, so that that's kind of the hard sell for a Braid. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's very true. Well, we got a few more honorable mentions. Life Goes On, Bantu's Last Reckoning, Hollow One, and Liliana's Defeat, which actually leads us into that entire cycle. So let's leave Liliana's Defeat on the sidelines for now. I'll talk about the cycle separately. What about the first three, Richard? Any thoughts on those? Life Goes On is my favorite card of the set. <laughs> <laughs> I just need ways to auto win against Burn. And this is it. Like, poor burn players, life gain cards have been getting better and better. And the important thing about Life Goes On, it's one mana. It gives you a shot of getting it under a Skull Crack or Tarkus Command. Uh, you know, turn two Fatal Push Life Goes On is pretty much the game against burn. So I suspect you will see this in sideboards uh, if burn is prevalent. Uh, fatal Push, Life Goes On, like Jun colors, Abzan colors, just natural... A natural home and gaining eight life is, is just game over. It's like a two or three for one against burn. So I'm really excited about life goes on. Yeah, life goes on does seem pretty crazy. I think is this just the best life gain spell that has ever been printed? Do we have anything more efficient than gain eight for one? 
No, no. I think uh, other cards in modern you you see are like core firewalker or something or um, feed the clan. Yeah, feed I think. the clan. If you have a creature of creature with power four or greater, the problem with those cards are they're slow. So most of the time when you play them, same with like timely reinforcements, you just eat a skull crack and die. Uh, with this, it's one mana, so you can sneak it in when they go to Boros Charm you. Then you just fail push light goes on and pretty much wrap up the game right there. Uh, as for the rest of the cards, Bantu's Last Reckoning, we've talked about it length on the podcast and stuff. It's hard to imagine a deck and a meta where it's better than Anger of the Gods and some of the other options, but it's possible and Hollow One is, like, this janky combo card, I think. There's ways you can technically, like, draw three, discard three for one mana, and then you get free Hollow Ones. I don't think that would be, like, a real deck, but it's a thing you can do that's fairly interesting. So, lastly, we have the Color Hate Cycle. So, we've seen Color Hate cards be pretty powerful in sideboards in the past in Modern. Where do these ones fit, Richard? Can you imagine these showing up in sideboards as well? Yeah, Liliana's Defeat is very interesting because it hits a lot of scary things in modern. Liliana of the Veil is a very hard-to-deal-with Planeswalker, uh, which Liliana's Defeat obviously kills. Uh, We have other cards, Gurmag Angler, Tastigur, Death Shadow, just like so many hard-to-deal-with black creatures that uh, I could see this being in sideboards. I could see people playing this. I I don't know what you would cut for it, but... It seems like a Celestial Purge type card that, you know, there are, all, are there enough powerful things floating around that you might consider playing one mana spell. And, you know, couple that with Snapcaster Mages, Fatal Pushes, it's, you just get insane tempo because it's just a one mana removal. Yeah, as for the rest of them, it's really, it's so meta dependent. Like, if you, there's red Planeswalkers you really need to kill, like Nahiri, Chandra's Defeat is pretty good. I don't know if there's enough red creatures to really merit sideboard consideration three mana land destruction is interesting but i don't know how many green enchantments or planeswalkers there are and we have just real three mana land destruction in modern and this is defeat uh jace's defeat i don't see game say showing up in sideboards and i don't think countering jace will change that and then gideon's defeat maybe we see some like human company decks with a lot of aggressive white creatures that are kind of climbing the format but still it's a it's a tough sell to play something that limited so i think that liliana's defeat is probably the closest to being a sideboard card i think in the format well let's move on to our actual top 10 starting off with one of the new planeswalkers sam at the tested so richard this was one i wanted on the list do you have any thoughts on this one you really like double moon walkers, don't you? It's got <laughs> that is the moon. only legitimate got... place for Samet. And it is very powerful in that deck. But outside of that deck, I don't see any reason you would ever play this card. Yeah, I mean, and this is partly a testament to the set itself, Hour of Devastation, not having a ton of great options. We have cards like Samet. So Samet is a horrible Planeswalker. Horrible, horrible, to Balt level bad. Except in the doubling season deck where it's actually pretty sweet because you can immediately ultimate, which means you can get some sort of game winning combo. Uh, you can get an Ahiri to get an Emrakul. You can get Restoration Angels and Kiki Jikis. There's a million different ways you can win the game. I can't imagine ever playing it outside of there and Double Moon Planeswalkers is admittedly a fringe deck, but it's got this weird cult following of people that really like it. So I think if you're playing that deck, then Sama is in consideration and probably a decent part of it. So are you slamming four Samets into Double Moon Walker, or is it more of a one or two of? So the thing I like about Sama and Double Moon Walkers is right now the deck is really greedy on colors, especially considering you're a main deck Blood Moon deck. You're trying to play like double blue for Jace because that's one of the best Planeswalkers to ultimate and get Nahiri. So I think that you can build a more focused deck like Naya, which makes your Blood Moons a little less detrimental to yourself if you Birds of Paradise get killed or whatever. So I think you can build a more focused deck that's built around Sama and Nahiri being the two main 
main payoffs for doubling season and not worry so much about how am I going to have double blue to cast a Jace and some of the other Planeswalkers. I think Jace is a better Planeswalker, but maybe because you can kind of make your deck more consistent by dropping a color or two might make Samet better. It's like a... I don't think it's better than Nahiri. Nahiri's literally just get a Samet Samet basically does the same thing with an extra step in between, so I think you would play some number on top of the Nahiris in the deck. Well, let's move on. Number nine on our list, Frank Sanity. So, Richard, I want to ask you, this, to me, bears mention because it has an instant win combo with Traumatize. You get a Frank Sanity down, you cast Traumatize, you mill your opponent's entire library. Mill is a super popular but never very good archetype. Do you think this combo can push Mill to the forefront of modern. People will try, <laughs> and I suspect it will win quite a few games against people that are unprepared, but it's such a slow combo. I, I can't see it be consistently good against Tier 1 decks in the format. Yeah, that is a concern. Emrakul is also a concern. Shuffle in uh, effects, which kind of just randomly hose your combo back. But I think... I'm excited for this card because I just know how much people love Mill. Whenever I play a Mill deck, it's just so popular. People love the idea of Mill. So I expect at your FMs in tournaments on that level, you're going to see a lot of people building around this card and trying to Mill people out with it. What about not a dedicated Mill deck, but as a two-card combo finish for a control deck? So play like Blue Black or Esper Control and just use this to kill your opponent? Yeah. I that's actually a pretty interesting idea because kind of, oh ahead. sorry, kind of like Helm of Obedience Rest in Peace. It's it's a two card combo that kills people, but a lot of the times it goes in, you know, a weird control deck or something and it's just a, a two card finisher as opposed to all in on the combo plan. That actually makes a lot of sense. I could definitely see that being a thing and maybe the best way to go about it. I mean, the downside is Frank Sanity doesn't do much on its own, and incidentally milling people when they crack a fetch or something isn't that relevant, but as a two-card combo finish, it in some ways it is reminiscent of, like, the old twin combo decks. You could play twin, like literal <laughs> twin deck, but instead of <laughs> playing Deceiver Exarchs and Flitter Twins, you just Frank Sanity people, maybe? <laughs> yeah, when they, when they play two Tarmogoyce and a Death Shadow, and you just traumatize them, and <laughs> yep. then... That's it. You mill them for their Liliana to reanimate with. Uh, so maybe not on the same power level as Twin, because those pieces do stuff independently. But it is interesting that you could use a two-card combo finish in Modern with this two, with these two cards. All right. Well, we'll have to wait and see about Frank Sanity. But what about our next card, number eight on our list? The new, very expensive humility, Overwhelming Splendor. So, Richard, any hot takes on the new curse? So, it's eight to cast, which <laughs> means it's pretty hard to cast. So, the the only deck would probably be Enduring Ideal, where you just play a bunch of enchantments. And this one is pretty brutal. Uh, having a humility on the battlefield pretty much locks up any creature-based decks. So this this has a ch this has a chance of making that deck a better deck and maybe even a tier 1.5 or tier 1 deck. Yeah, the thing I really like about it is the humility is awesome, and that beats decks on its own, but the not being able to activate abilities is actually super key against, uh, let's say, a deck like Lantern Control, which is still a big thing. That's a deck that most of your pieces in an Enduring Ideal deck are like ghostly prisons and spheres of safety, these kind of lock pieces that keep you from dying to creatures, but having, there's certain decks that kind of combo on a different level, like the Lantern Control deck, and this shutting down all the activated abilities on artifacts, basically all non-Planeswalkers, lets the deck beat things that I think it would normally struggle with beating. Of course it's super expensive, which means you probably shouldn't try to hard cast this, right? Could you <laughs> picture a deck trying to ramp into Overwhelming Splendor or something, or probably not? Uh, Overwhelming Splendor Tron? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could. You could. That's the thing you could do. Well, we'll have to see. Maybe Enduring Ideal will get a bit better. It's a neat and fun idea, and when you have an Enduring Ideal, it doesn't really matter how much your enchantments cost. So eight mana is the same as two mana, so eh, we'll see. It could happen. 
Yeah, I mean, Enduring Ideal is seven mana. I mean, <laughs> if you can cast your Enduring Ideal, you can probably get to one more and cast Overwhelming Splendor the hard way anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point. Well, let's move on. Number seven on our list, and I know you like this card, Richard, or you're interested in it, Obelisk Spider. So what do you have to say about this one? So Obelisk Spider you can use with Anafenza uh, combo to uh, drain your opponent. So it would replace Murderous Red Cap. Uh, the problem with Murder's Red Cap is it kind of does nothing. It's a four <laughs> mana two two, and it's in weird colors. So now you can go Abzan, uh, have a one four blocker that's kind of legitimate, and combo off. Uh, the downside of this card is you can't combo off with Malira or Vizier because uh, those prevent minus one minus one counters. But Obelisk could see you know fringe play in some kind of Abzan and Offenza deck, uh, replacing what would traditionally be the the win con, which is Murderous Red Cap. Yeah, I mean it's the right mana cost. At three mana, you can hit it with Collected Company. You can't hit Murderous Red Cap with Collected Company, so that's like an upside. You can cord for it. So in the body is like weirdly good. I think I'd rather have a 1-4 with reach to like block Delvers and stuff than have a murderous red cap body on the battlefield. So, I don't know. The combo is kind of shifted somewhat with the printing of uh, the Vizier Druid combo where a lot of the Abzan decks are going for the infinite mana combo now more than the Anafenza combo. But maybe Obelisk Spider could make, at least be part of that. Part of like the backup combo where you can just randomly kill people in another way. You can never have too many I win the game combos in a deck especially when you have collected companies and Chords of Calling to piece them together. Uh, well let's move on. To number six on our list, Giroux with eyes wide open. So, Richard, any thoughts about the new Planeswalker Tutor creature? I don't know why it's on the list. You're going to have to explain it to me, Seth. Uh, all right. I didn't think of this being a card that would be played in modern either but then jeff hooglin who is court of calling master plays court of calling decks when everyone else is playing different things was kind of excited about the fact that you could court of calling for this and then use that to get a planeswalker so it's kind of a way you can in your like naya cord list cord for calling for a nahiri for example or something along those lines whether or not that's good enough i don't know if it does see play it would be a like a one of tutor target type thing but maybe i mean it is interesting that you could cord for calling a uh, cord of calling for a planeswalker now yeah it seems like a lot of work because the planeswalker goes to your hand uh but who knows? I mean, <laughs> if Jeff says it, Jeff plays Kiki Cord like nonstop and is the master of it. So it, it is worth a shot. And maybe we will see it as a one of in some of these decks. Well, let's move on to number five on our list. The new creature land, Hostile Desert. So Richard, any thoughts on this one? It's a good rate, but has some drawbacks. What do you think? Yeah, it's a colorless land and it's a very efficient, I guess, muta vault, uh, except you have to exile a land card from your graveyard. The The problem I see here is decks that want colorless mana usually don't play fetch lands. So you, you might have a hard time actually exiling lands from your graveyard, but if you manage to do it somehow, you have a 3-4 uh, for 2 mana, which is an exceptional rate on a land that enters the battlefield untapped. So if you can somehow get lands in your graveyard while playing colorless, I think this would most likely go in you know, colored decks with fetch lands as opposed to a pure colorless deck like Aldrazi or Tron. Uh, but you never know. It's just a very powerful creature land, so I expect people to try it out somewhere. Yeah, when I first saw this card, I was like, oh, that can definitely see modern play. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, all right, well, Eldrazi or a deck that really wants colorless lands, like you said, doesn't have fetch lands, so it's going to be hard to activate. And then... And remember, it's only your graveyard, so you can't take advantage of your opponent's fetch lands. And then another segment of decks, like Merfolk and like that, probably want Mutavault because of the tribal implications, makes it better. So it kind of like limits you to two and three colored decks. And then you have the cost of running a colorless land. So I think it's powerful. Like, the rate is good. Two mana, exile land to become a creature is very efficient. It's cheaper than, like, Stirring Wildwood for being activated and has the same stats, bigger than Mutavault. I'm just not exactly sure what deck will want it, but it's worth 
keeping in mind. We've seen Creature Lands be super playable over Magic's history in Modern and in Standard, so it's worth taking notice whenever a rare Creature Land, especially one with that big of a body and that cheap of an activated cost, is printed. Let's move on to number four on our list. We have the Stifle Bird, Nimble Obstructionist. So I know you were kind of like lukewarm on this card at first, but then maybe I talked you into it with Stifling Fetch Lands. What's your opinion now, Richard, a few days later on the Obstructionist? I like it. I really like it. When you think of it as an instant speed stone rain that cantrips, <laughs> it's a pretty good deal. The real, the line that really gets to me is if you're on the play, your opponent has two lands, they crack a fetch, uh, you basically cycle stifle them, <laughs> and they're down to one land and you drew a card. Like, that's just backbreaking. And, you know, when you can cycle, it makes any card good, right? Like, if this card is bad, just cycle it. And it's a three to cast three, one flying flash. So you can actually use it as a finisher, similar to Vendillion Click. So I think it's pretty good. At first, I couldn't figure out what you want to stifle in modern, but fetch lands, uh, Emrakul triggers, stuff like that. Uh, there, there's a lot of stuff you can stifle. So uh, I think it's it's going to see you play somewhere as a one or two up, similar to uh, Vendillion Click. Yeah, I, I agree. That is, the line you described is potentially just game-winning. People forget, if you don't play Legacy, getting your land stifled is so brutal. Like, you definitely, if you watch Legacy coverage, you'll see people, they, like, crack their fetch, it gets stifled, and they just do nothing for the entire rest of the game and lose because of it. And now we have an option to do that in Standard, and of course we had that with, like, Disallow or something, but the fact that it doesn't cost you a card and it can be a pretty reasonable evasive threat on its own makes me really excited for this card. I It's another card I don't know exactly where it fits, maybe some sort of flash deck, maybe a control deck where Vendillion Click would fit. So I don't know where it fits, but the abilities on it are definitely super powerful. Let's move on to number three. Three on our list, Ramanop Excavator. So, Richard, what do you think about the new Crucible of Worlds on a body? Yeah, we're going to play 8 Crucible now. <laughs> uh, this is a very interesting card because you can cord for it, you can collect a company for it, you can play it with Crucible to have 8, and a lot of decks in Modern only play 2 or 3 basics. You can ghost quarter them to death. Uh, by replaying your ghost quarters with this card. So I I suspect people will try this somewhere. I'm not sure where it would go. You wouldn't just randomly play it uh, in your deck, but in the right deck, I think this is a very powerful ability. And being on a creature might actually be an upside as opposed to a downside that it usually is because of all the great tutors and uh, collected company type cards we have in Modern. Yeah, that's what I think, too. That's the big upside. It's obviously less resilient, dies to Lightning Bolt and Path and Fatal Push a lot of the time, but the fact that you can tutor it up when you need it makes it a lot easier to play this as, like, a one-of and use it in certain situations or a two-of and still have access to it. The Ghost Quarter Lock can actually be pretty impressive. If you look at a lot of the best decks in the format right now, you have, like, Eldrazi Tron decks, which have maybe a couple ways. You have these three or four color the shadow decks that have maybe a couple basics it doesn't take that many ghost quarters to actually just get your opponent out of basic lands and build yourself into a strip mine and being in green it also gives you access to just some sweet stuff with like knight of the reliquary you can sack lands and then get them back from your graveyard so you're kind of sacking for free and tutoring up your ghost quarters and stuff so i'm interested to see if there could be maybe some sort of green white hate bearer type list that takes advantage of this with leon and arbiter to keep getting back the ghost quarters and i i think there's potential there i don't have the list yet but i think people will We'll definitely try it because there are some big upsides to being a creature rather than just an artifact. Well, let's move forward to number two on our list. We have Solemnity. So, Richard, our spoiler card. What do you think about this one in modern? Do you think this actually has legs in the format? I don't know what you would do with it, but it's a very powerful effect. So, you can uh, combo with Phyrexian Unlife which basically uh, turns damage into infect when you're dead, and then this just prevents all counters. So basically you're immortal as long <laughs> as this sits around. Uh, you can you can just randomly hose like the combo decks, like the Malira combo decks, uh, infect, 
there's a lot of just random stuff this stops. Now, whether it's important enough for you to play in your deck, I'm not sure, but I think it's like a rest and feast. It's always good to have sitting around, and when you need it, it'll go in your sideboard, and when you don't, it won't. So it's, it's a very interesting card, and it does a lot of interesting things. So I suspect we'll see this in Modern at some point. Yeah, it's one of those cards that gets better as time goes along, as Wizards will undoubtedly print more things involving counters, uh, maybe more infect creatures eventually we could have, or other mechanics it interacts with, so it's never going to really get worse. As a hate card right now, as a sideboard card, I think it's kind of middling. In fact, is already kind of far down in the format thanks to Fatal Push, but I do really like the potential of it comboing with Phyrexian Unlife. I don't know if it'll happen, but we do have decks like Ad Nauseum that already play Phyrexian Unlife, so it's possible that either in the main deck or the sideboard, they could play this as, like, just this weird lock. Also, we've had these Enchantment Prison decks. We were talking about Enduring Ideal earlier. I think this would definitely be part of that. Phyrexian Unlife is already played in that deck just as, like, a game 10, essentially. And now the fact that you can play Solemnity as a one-of and just tutor up a hard lock, you have ways to protect your enchantments, which makes a lock even harder, has potential, or even just, like, a Enchantress deck of some kind where where you're trying to slow down the game with ghostly prisons and spheres of safety, maybe drawing some cards with some sort of enchantress, and using this as just another thing you can draw into and kind of lock your opponent. So I think there's a lot of different things that can happen. We'll just have to wait and see, but anytime you have two three-mana cards that basically form a pretty hard lock on a weird permanent type, enchantments are one of the harder things to deal with. Colgan's Command doesn't get them. Uh, a lot of the removal in the format's focused on artifacts because of Tron, because of Affinity but not so much on enchantments, this lock is just going to randomly get some people out of nowhere, I think. Well, let's move on to the last card on our list. We have Claim to Fame, the new Aftermath card. So, Richard, what do you think about the new Unearth with Aftermath Upside? Yep, return target creature with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield is a very powerful ability in Modern. We have... So many good cards. We have Death Shadows, we have Tarmogoyce, we have Snapcasters. Basically any creature that's being played in Modern uh, fits this bill. So it comes directly into the battlefield. And then you also have the fame part, which just gives something plus two, plus zero, and haste. Uh, imagine your opponent top decking a claim to fame, getting their Death Shadow back, hitting you with like a 15 power creature with haste. Uh, I can see losing some games like that. So... Both sides seem extremely relevant. Being black and red are the perfect colors. Those are the Jun colors where you have Death Shadow, you have Tarmogoyf, you have Grim Player. Uh, even something like Dark Confidant, you, you're not going to bash with it, but just getting it back and drawing more cards uh, is a pretty good deal. So it's a very interesting card. And the question is, are you willing to cut something from those decks today to put, put this card in? So, Richard, you're the Jund master are you planning on trying to fit Claim to Fame into your Jun list? Uh, maybe, just to try it. I don't know what you would cut, because the flex slots are typically removal, and usually more removal is good. But I could see trying this Claim to Fame plan. Uh, I think it's more likely in a Death Shadows deck, uh, because you're a lot more aggressive, and getting that haste is actually a big deal. Like, Death Shadow plus Fame... Uh, really hurts. So I, I expect it to be more played in Jun Death Shadow, but I don't know. It, it's just a really powerful card, and we'll, we'll see if it has a home. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our top modern cards for modern from Hour of Devastation. So Richard, any final thoughts on anything on the way out the door? Uh, I expect a lot of people to get stifled. <laughs> <laughs> I, I expect there will be some feel bads, uh, and people will think twice about sacrificing their fetch lands because I know blue players are are tricky, and that's what they want to do. <laughs> so uh, there's some interesting cards. We didn't have any powerful over the top mythics uh, that you know we don't have like that fatal push where you you look and you see you know every deck will play this, uh, but we do have some exciting cards. I'm most excited for. Uh, the Stifle Bird, uh, the Crucible Creature, and uh, the last card, 
we just saw claim to fame. So those are some pretty interesting cards, and I'll be trying those out, and maybe they will make a splash in Modern. Yeah, I think that's my big takeaway for Modern from this set, is there's not anything that's obviously going to be a staple in the format, but just reading over the list, all the way down to, like, fraying sanities and all that stuff, there's a ton of cards that I expect people to be at least testing out. There's a ton of stuff that's in the conversation, and a lot of it's really cool because it's different than anything we've seen before. We're not saying, oh, is Grim Filet or a slightly more efficient two-drop than Tarmogoyf? We're saying, like, oh, can Solemnity make this entirely new lock? Can Frank Sanity make this entirely new mill combo deck? So I like that there's a lot of new things happening in the set, even if not many of them end up being real decks or kind of taking over the format. I think it's an exciting time to have a lot of new cards to be testing out that might be good enough to do something in the format. Anyway, I think that wraps it up for today. So Richard, thanks so much for taking the time to do it. It's always fun to talk about the new cards. Yeah, my pleasure. It's always great theory crafting and it's trying to trying to make these cards work in modern and basically surprise people at FNM <laughs> when they see you play these brand new cards they read them and then they go ah oh, ah oh, you got me so it's always fun talking new cards with yourself uh well thanks again and thanks to everyone for watching so that wraps up our top modern cards from hour of devastation and we'll be back in a couple of months to talk about some new Ixalan cards so until then we'll talk to you soon Thanks for watching the video! If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.